live debate. IntelligenceSquared.com Professor Eugene Rogan, thank you very much for agreeing to this interview before the uh, uh, panel debate it's a on the spread of Arab democracy, question mark. Um, professor Rogan, you're Professor of Middle Eastern History at Oxford University, Fellow of St. Anthony's, is it? That's correct. Um, and you recently published uh, uh, a book, uh, The Arabs of History, it's published by Penguin. Um, I have to say I recommend it hugely. It's um, extremely, uh, the, the writing is very lively, the story is utterly, um, utterly fascinating and um, to my mind, under, uh, we, we don't know enough of it, um, typically. And it'd be a really interesting, uh, uh, quite separately from the event uh, tonight and the events of the past few weeks, to hear you talk a little bit about what your view of the history of Arab, what, what should we call it, uh, liberal nationalism is. It seems as if it's a, uh, a movement, a spirit that's been trying to get off the ground for a while. Yeah, thank you, Tony. It's a pleasure to be here tonight. And I think the recent turn of events have shown an excitement that's part of Arab history that, uh, that makes talking about the past and the present seem so it's natural and seamless. When we look at the events in Egypt and Tunisia in the 21st century, the antecedents go right back to the 19th century. These were really the two countries that led the Arab world in the reform agenda of the 19th century and in pursuing constitutional reform. It's so interesting to see them once again in the leadership position here in 2011. So, give us a little bit, and that, that 19th century, is, 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 is that, that's, that's a history under Ottoman rule of these, uh, of these Ottoman provinces under the Caliphate. What sort of space do they have for uh, political reform, political development at that time? What are the influences? Tunisia and Egypt were both Ottoman provinces that were growing in autonomy in the course of the 19th century, and both really pursued their own political and economic developments with increasing autonomy from the Ottomans which meant they actually had the space to engage in debates about constitutional rule or the creation of parliaments, even before the Ottomans themselves could get around to that. You had, starting in the 1830s, a debate framed by a Muslim cleric from Al-Azhar in Cairo named uh, Rifat Rafat Tahtawi. Uh, his book is now available in translation under the title An Imam in Paris. But among the things that Tahtawi does, besides describing this strange and exotic foreign land called France, is he reproduces, article by article, the French constitutional charter and talks his Egyptian audience through what that kind of contract between rulers and rulers meant. And the book was an instant bestseller in Arabic in the 19th century meaning of that word, and then was very quickly translated to Turkish, and so injected the debate about constitutional reform already in the 1830s in Egypt. So, uh, in some sense, even the, uh, the, 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 the birth of Turkish nationalism, the Turkish Republic, Republican ideas, come through uh, Tunisia and Egypt, do they? Those will come in the course of time through a host of influences, but the Tunisian experience followed the Egyptian. You had a man by the name of Khairuddin al Tunisi, who, again, Francophone, a man of the world, read Tahtawi, and was very interested in trying to address what he saw as the abuse of power by the ruling bays by creating a sort of contract. He saw the constitution as fulfilling that role. And so he too was instrumental in trying to bring reforms to Tunisia in the 1850s and 60s, and then went on to become prime minister of the Ottoman Empire, the grand vizier of the Ottoman Empire. So there's really this sort of transnational group of thinkers influencing the Arab world, the Ottoman world, and setting change in motion that will lead in the Ottoman context to a constitution and the convening of the first Ottoman parliament in 1876. So these are really parliamentary, constitutional, liberal reform movements today that are drawing on very deep historical roots. But then one of the stories that you tell absolutely fascinatingly is the divergence between the, uh, uh, the language of democracy, the, 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 the language of national self-determination, which comes, you, you mentioned, it comes all the, you know, right from the time of Napoleon's conquest of Egypt. Already Napoleon is saying we're here in order to liberate you, this story of, uh, uh, you know, Western promises 
imperial promises to liberate and to give autonomy. Um, these are, the, the, there's, there's, there's a whole lot of language about that, and then the reality doesn't quite live up to it, does it? Well, I think one of the arguments I make in the book, The Arabs, is that the Arab world has found itself acted upon by outside actors imposing their rules on the region. And I think the foreign invaders claiming to liberate the Arab world, but really trying to impose their authority on the region for their own geostrategic reasons, is, is one of the big themes in modern Arab history. What it means for us today is that if you try to present your government's policies to promote democracy or to affect regime change in the interest of the people, you should expect a very sophisticated uh, Arab public to know their history well enough to suspect your motives. And I think when George W. Bush offers to liberate the people of Iraq from the tyranny of Saddam Hussein, he was really seen with more skepticism than as a kind of hero figure or a liberator. That, that's very interesting. One of the things that you um, mentioned in your introduction is that we, we've got into the habit of saying, oh, that's history, as a way of dismissing something. And yet, as you point out, history is something which continues to, continues to live. Can, can you describe the ways, the, the echoes? I mean, for example, one feels that 2011 in Egypt has echoes of 1919 and the protests then. Can you describe a little bit of that, that atmosphere of 1919 in which, again, there was protests to, um, uh, for, for the Egyptian people to rule themselves? It's a very good parallel. It was a time of sustained demonstrations in the instance of 1919 against foreign occupation. Britain had been ruling Egypt since 1882. So it was after a long period of British colonial rule and then after the difficulties of the First World War that the people of Egypt really wished to play on the promise they heard from President Wilson of the United States of a new order based on national self-determination and they decided to make politics with their feet, to do a kind of plebiscite where they weren't allowed to vote by filling the streets of Cairo and the other Egyptian cities with demonstrators all calling for recognition of Egypt's right to independence. And has that, has that, uh, uh, that period of protest in 1919, has that, is, has that, does that live today? Would, would the protesters in Tahrir Square uh, these past few weeks have had this story told to them in schools, handed down through families, is it, is it living history? It's living history, and it's part of a genealogy of history that would embrace the events of 1919, the revolution of 1952, the Nasserist struggle against outside domination. There are were, were critical moments there where the crowds came together to demand political change. And these are the real turning points on which the Arab history has been taught, learned, understood. So people in Tahrir Square, they were aware that they were living history and they were inspired by past moments of the Egyptian people rising as one voice to demand change. Sometimes the change they got lived up to their expectations. Sometimes they were disappointed. So they're also nervous. They can see in 2011 that things can go much, much better, but there's still dangers ahead that might mean it turns much worse. So what would be the best example of uh, change going the way that they wanted it to go. I mean, it, it's quite tempting to think, well, actually, almost at every turn of this attempt at uh, gaining uh, national self-determination, something or other, some way or other, conspired to actually make the experiment not work, not stick. It's true, but I think you could still point to one period in recent history in the immediate aftermath of the Free Officers' Revolution in 1952, where the Egyptian people, who had felt themselves to still be hindered by their relationship to Great Britain, and to be under a corrupt monarchy in which they had no confidence, and to be going to the polls for fractious political parties they didn't believe in, they saw a charismatic group of officers, this is before Nasser really emerged as the leader, bringing the promise of modernity, of military strength, of Egypt leading an Arab world that would once again regain a position of pride in international affairs. And I think that that dream went from 1952 right through to the end of the 1950s with such important turning points as defeating a tripartite collusion in the, the Suez Crisis. 
in seeing a union with Syria in 1958, overcoming the boundaries drawn by the imperial powers. I think those years were a period where Egyptians were incredibly excited, and a period of tremendous artistic creativity. And, uh, and in this way, I think maybe you could point to one moment where the Egyptian people really saw their dreams fulfilled, but it didn't last. One of the high moments of that period was uh, when the Americans supported uh, 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 NASA against the French and the British at Suez. And in that, is there a sense in which the, 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 the previous attempt uh, by America to influence Egyptian affairs was at the, uh, uh, at the uh, uh, Paris conference, in which actually the Americans were very much, again, pressing for uh, Arab self-determination, but were completely overruled by the French and the British. Was there a sense in which uh, that moment of 1956 looked back to the uh, Paris conference and the, and the intricate diplomacy that had frustrated the Americans and the American uh, uh, project for the region at that time. I think people in the Arab world always hail back to that Wilsonian moment as a high point of America's standing in their esteem. And they compare America's policies when it became increasingly involved and increasingly interested in the Arab world to its detriment. So what happened to the America we knew of Woodrow Wilson that seemed to respect the rights of peoples to self-determination? By the time you get to the American role in Suez, already Egyptian-American relations are being strained, largely because America is trying to force Egypt to take sides in the Cold War. At those times, America couldn't distinguish between a neutral position and a pro-American position. They really saw a kind of you're with us or against us uh, in, in their other countries in the world. They just didn't get it that the Egyptians coming out of many years of being under an imperial situation, privileged independence over all other things, and did not wish to be drawn into alliances in the Cold War. And this put America and Egypt on a collision course, which undermined already by 1956, the Egyptian relations with America. So, uh, we, 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 in, in a sense, after, the, uh, after World War I, we have empire that collides with, uh, with ambitions for self-determination. Um, that gradually becomes, uh, turns into a, a mixture of interest in oil and, as you say, Cold War. Then uh, uh, policy towards Israel becomes the next thorn in the flesh. Uh, then, after the end of the Cold War, we have uh, the rise of fear of Islamism, the, 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 the rise of uh, uh, Islamic extremist terrorism, etc. That again, so it seems to stop the, the uh, 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 any kind of normalization of relations, etc. Are we? Are you, are you hopeful? Do you think we've got to a point at which actually there isn't going to be another great big roadblock that comes up here? I think the more America has gotten implicated in the Middle East, the more its relations with Middle Eastern peoples has become strained. And I think in the past decade, that probably reached breaking point. I think the 10 years since the events of 11 September 2001 probably stands as the absolute low point in modern Arab history. And it's left very deep scars on Arab-American relations. No doubt the election of Barack Obama did a great deal to persuade people in the Arab world to listen to America again. They have confidence in this man's good intentions, but they're suspicious of America's policies. And so, as we see this important turning point with the revolutions of 2011, it's going to be essential for the Americans to take policies that will be consistent towards the region and supportive of their drive for freedom. On that, they could build a new relationship in the 21st century on mutual respect and mutual interests. But there's still a lot of distrust to be overcome. And will freedom and self-determination, which has so long been a difficult, uh, a, a, a difficult prize, a difficult goal to actual, actually reach, uh, will it be enough? Will it disappoint? I mean, you know, one, one, again, one, one of the feelings one has is, well, uh, fine, you're going to get it, but that's, that's, things are still going to be very hard. You're in a, 
in a, a, a globalised world in which it's difficult to make a living, in which uh, uh, your infrastructure, your levels of education, etc., all these problems are not going to go away. Is, what's the, is, is, there a, is, is there a worry of disappointed expectations at this point? I think that there is a sense of great optimism in Egypt and Tunisia right now. And that it is making people overlook their concerns for the moment. They're trying to build on their new sense of ownership over their own countries. There is no doubt that the next months will be crucial for these revolutions to fulfill their potential and to create the kind of free and open societies with open politics, no more political prisons, free speech, free assembly, in which the people of the Arab world will be able to get on with their lives in public without fear. If they can get there, they'll already have made such a massive improvement over what their lives had been, that they will be able to address the challenges of the global economy, at least as a whole people instead of a broken people. But they're aware that huge challenges lie ahead. And it's an economy that is driving riots in Greece, in Ireland, in Spain, not to mention the protests we've been seeing in Egypt and Tunisia. That's the reality of the world in 2011. So it's a hard time to come out from under the, sort of, the boot of autocratic rule. But better to be out from under the boot as you face these challenges than still trying to do it from within a kind of crony elite that's enriching itself at the people's expenses. Professor Rogan, thank you very much. Thank you.